and then I'll hand it over to you, Jared, to introduce Mike. And we'll get the show rolling. No worries. So it's my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Mike Klemenko. Um, he's a research fellow in the Centre for Exoton Science. Hang on a second. So I will just increase the signal to noise here. The noise being my six-year-old. Um, uh, Mike is, um, as I said, a research fellow in the Centre for Exoton Science. Um, he came to Melbourne from the Ukraine, where he previously worked at Samsung, and he's been doing some really excellent work with, in my group on exotons in organic and inorganic um, materials. And today he's going to talk about semiconductor block equations and some of the work that he's been doing both in exoton science and with um, partners in Fleet. Take it away, Mark. All right, thank you. Very nice for kind introduction. Now I'm going to share my screen. And please let me know if you can see my slides. Yep, all good. And can you hear me well? Yep. Yeah, all right. So today I'd like to talk about semiconductor block equations. It's a very handy tool to uh, predict optical properties of semiconductors uh, in different regimes. Uh, ultra fast responses and nonlinear optics. And it's, it's been extremely useful for last uh, decades. And uh, I'd like to, today I'd like to give you a theoretical tutorial, which will be about how to derive semiconductor block equations for your particular needs, because for different systems, a uh, form of semiconductor block equations is different. And then I will give you practical tutorial. It's all about how to implement and how to compute those equations to get uh, optical properties of semiconductors. And the motivation is uh, justified by our interest in light matter interactions. It's been a long time since people started being interested in optical properties of matter. For example, in stained glasses, people wanted to control a color and transparency of glass, and they wanted to understand how to do it in a, a controllable way. More recent example of our interest in light matter interaction is uh, light emitting diets. Two decades ago, people were interested in how to make uh, light emitting diets uh, generate light uh, across all visible uh, range of electromagnetic spectrum, and We've invented many semiconductor materials, many semiconductor alloys that allows us to cover all visible range and even ultraviolet. And for this, uh, Akasaki, Amano and Nakamura, they've got a Nobel Prize for inventing blue and green light emitting diets. So we can now make an RGB system. And during this time, semiconductor block equations has been developed because uh, when we invent new material, we need to characterize it and we need a theoretical tool to understand why this uh, semiconductor uh, interacts with matter in this particular way. So this is motivation behind semiconductor block equation. In order to understand semiconductor block equation, uh, we need expertise in many different areas of physics. So semiconductor block equations comes from uh, many areas of physics and it requires knowledge in semiconductor physics because semiconductor block equations, it uses knowledge of electronic structure of semiconductors. Also, we need uh, many body physics because semiconductor block equations deals with scattering effects, electron correlations, and uh, also semiconductor block equations are related to nonlinear optics and ultra fast optics because they gives us a response on uh, optical excitations and we can use semiconductor block equations to compute absorption spectrum luminescence spectrum we can use it to characterize pump probe experiments and many other optical nonlinear optical phenomena and yeah, it's pretty complex conception from a theoretical point of view, but it's, it shows, the, our experience shows that semiconductor block equations are very useful because we can use them to predict very wide range of phenomena in semiconductors. So first let's start with theoretical tutorial. 
So you probably familiar with conception of Bloch equations. They used to describe spin dynamics in uh, electron uh, spin resonance system. Also, we know Maxwell Bloch equations, which describe uh, optical response of two level system. Here we have two level system with a ground state, excited state. And to describe interaction of two level system with optical radiation, we can use density matrix. Diagonal elements of density matrix describe a population of states, non-diagonal elements are polarizations. And dynamic of density matrix elements are given by Liouville equation. And if we know Hamiltonian of the system, we can derive a set of kinetic equations. And this equation contains all the information about optical response of this two level system, including linear and nonlinear response and all optical phenomena that are related to two-level system can be described by Maxwell Bloch equations. But in semiconductors, the picture is a little bit more complicated because instead of just two levels, we have energy bands. And the energy bands are filled by electrons. So essentially, it is many-body problem because electrons that are occupying bands, they are interacting with each other via Coulomb interaction. And the question is how we can uh, transfer our knowledge about Maxwell Bloch equations to semiconductor physics. How, how, how could we apply Maxwell Bloch equations to semiconductors? So this is what I'm going to talk about today. And I will show that semiconductor Bloch equations as useful for semiconductors as mass, Maxwell Bloch equations are useful for uh, two-level system and nonlinear optics. So one way to tackle this problem would be to discretize energy bands and consider a semiconductor as an ensemble of two-level systems. So let's elaborate more on that. As usual in physics, we start with the Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian is a concept that describes energy. So in classical mechanics, uh, Hamiltonian is a total energy of the system. In quantum mechanics, is an operator that who des describes uh, total energy as well. So expectation value of this operator is a total energy. And it's very essential concept for physics because in physics, everything has energy. Uh, even vacuum has measurable non-zero energy. And if we can cannot assign energy to an object, it means this object doesn't belong to the physical reality. So let's consider systems that uh, interacts with uh, optical radiation. And in this case, we have three terms. First term describes kinetic energy of particles. Second term describes light matter interaction. And also we add a term that describes coupling, globe coupling between particles. Uh, in this uh, talk, we will express all operators in terms of uh, creation and annihilation operators. So we are working in second quantization formalism. It's useful because a second quantization uh, formalism gives us the right symmetry of wave function uh, relative to particle exchange. In terms of quantum chemistry, if we act by annihilation and creation operator on a ground state, uh, then we will get a, a slatter determinants with proper symmetry. So it's very useful in many body systems. Uh, in kinetic energy term consists of two terms, which is the kinetic energy of electrons and kinetic energy of holes. Energy in semiconductor is dependent on two indices. One is band index, another is uh, wave vector. So band index and wave vector, they are proper quantum numbers for quantum states in semiconductors. Also, we have a light matter interaction term. So D is a dipole moment, and E is an external electromagnetic field. So external electromagnetic field can generate electron hole pairs in semiconductor. And the last term is Coulomb interaction. Uh, v is a Coulomb uh, potential in uh, reciprocal space, Fourier transformed. The first term is a coupling between electrons. Second term is coupling between holes. 
and third term is coupling between electrons and holes. And this third term is responsible for excitonic effects because exciton is essentially electron hole pair where electrons and holes are coupled via uh, Coulomb interaction. Why I'm showing this to you is to show that it's pretty a uh, creative job to derive Hamiltonian because here I've just shown three terms, but we can add as many terms as we want. We can add electron uh, phonon interaction. We can add the uh, terms responsible for scatterings on impurities, dopants, and in principle, there are infinite number of possibilities. And each time we add new terms in Hamiltonian, we will derive a new set of semiconductor block equations. So you really need to consider your system and to define what kind of interaction are the most important one, or you can try different kinds of interaction and uh, compare your results with experimental data to define which is the dominant one. Uh, so the purpose of theoretical tutorial here is to show you that uh, semiconductor block equations can be derived in different ways for different systems. And it's pretty creative work to do. So now when we have Hamiltonian, we have to understand what we want to learn from the system, what are observables. Uh, the most general uh, and most usual uh, observables are elements of density matrix element. Density matrix elements give us information about population of states and polarization. Populations, also called distribution functions, show probability of particle to populate energy band in, with certain wave vector. And polarization shows optical response. And we are interested in dynamics of uh, density matrix elements. And this dynamics is given by Liouville equation for density matrix. It's pretty similar to the two level system we've considered before. So if we know Hamiltonian, in principle, we can derive kinetic equations and we will get information that describes optical response of the system. But this is not unique choice. We can uh, use uh, other alternatives. For example, if you are interested in luminescence, instead of density matrix element, we should solve kinetic equations regarding this uh, correlation function, which also includes photon statistics. So density matrix elements are good to describe absorption and gain spectrum, but it's not enough to describe luminescence and dark exciton. If we are interested in dark incoherent excitons, we should find out kinetics of this correlation function. But for the sake of uh, simplicity, let's just uh, consider a density matrix element in this tutorial. But we should keep in mind that we can uh, solve kinetic equations for any other correlation function which are relevant for our system. Now we can proceed to deriving uh, kinetic equations. So what we need to do, we need to evaluate commutator in the right hand side part. And the only tool, the only theoretical tool we need to do that is to remember commutation rules for uh, fermion creation annihilation operators. And these commutation rules, they are very important to simplify uh, product of products of correlation and uh, creation and annihilation operators. And commutation rules define a sign for each term. You can see that some terms have plus sign, some has minus sign. And this sign is determined by commutation rules. So this is how uh, kinetic equation for non-diagonal density matrix element looks like. It's pretty complex. And each term comes from the Hamiltonian term. So these are contribution from kinetic energy. These are contributions from uh, light matter interaction terms. And those four terms, they are resulted from Coulomb interaction between particles. And we have one, two, three, three uh, non-equivalent uh, uh, density matrix elements. So this is just one equation. In principle, we should have three kinetic equations. And a pair of uh, creation and annihilation operator, we can recognize it as a, a distribution function or polarization. 
But those products of four operators, operators are really unknown. They are correlation functions, and we cannot make closed system of equations because of these uh, four operators correlation functions. So we need to do something about it. In principle, it is what is called hierarchic problem. Each time we are trying to derive equations, for a pair of creation and annihilation operators, we will end up having a high order correlation function in the right-hand side part of equations. And if we again insert these four operator products into Liouville equations and try to derive more equations, we will end up having even higher order correlation at the right-hand side part. And we can, cannot close system of uh, differential equations. We have higher and higher order correlation all the time. So we have to truncate at some point. And there are different levels of approximation we can use. Maybe you've heard names like second born approximation and so on and so forth. The simplest approximation we can do here is Hartree Fock approximation. Hartree Fock approximation means that we uh, factorize products of four operators into groups of two operator products and neglect correlations, high order correlations. But we have to keep in mind that this is not accurate approximation. We always have a reminder representing correlations, high order correlation. But for uh, this tutorial, we just focus on Hartree Fock approximation, where we have direct Coulomb interaction and exchange. And when we do this factorization here, we will have a system of equations that look like this. The first equation is equation for polarization. And second and third equations describes the dynamic of electron and hole distribution functions. And the reminders corresponding to correlations, how the correlation are shown at the right hand side part here. So this is unknown uh, uh, values that we will have to approximate or we can derive them using uh, another iteration, another derivation from Liouville equations. And we can see uh, here sums of wave vectors. Those sums, they are responsible for many body effects. If we neglect all of them, we would have a system of independent differential equations uncoupled for each wave vector. This sums, they make equations uh, belonging to different uh, wave vectors coupled. And yeah, so many body effects, they are coupled, couples, couple different wave vectors. And we see that all this becomes, the, uh, all these equations are coupled. And uh, we can recognize that if we combine these two terms together, we have energy renormalization due to exchange uh, effect. And also we can recognize this term in square brackets as a Rabi frequency. So we can uh, write down semiconductor block equations in simpler form. And this looks pretty similar to uh, Maxwell block equations in uh, nonlinear optics. The only thing we have additional degree of freedom, which is wave vector, and many body effects couples a system of equations for different wave vectors. Yeah. So uh, Rabi frequency is here, and energy now is renormalized due to many body interaction between particles. So now I think we understand how to derive semiconductor block equation. And the main point which I want you to take from here is that semiconductor block equations are going to be different depending of how many interactions in your system you consider. If you add more interactions, you will get slightly different form of semiconductor block equations. And let's now dig into uh, practical details. So the first thing I'd like to consider is that if we neglect uh, dynamics of distribution function and approximate them by Fermi Dirac distribution functions, we will, uh, we will go into the linear optical response regime with quasi-equilibrium approximation. So 
in linear response regime, we don't need to solve equations for distribution functions because we assume that uh, optical signal is very weak and it's not able to change population of bands much. So the only thing that is time dependent is uh, only microscopic polarization here. So we need to solve just one equation. Uh, and we know immediately that electron distribution and whole distribution functions are given by Fermi Dirac distributions. So this is first approximation that we make. This is a simple case, linear response, quasi equilibrium approximation. If you want to do nonlinear optics, we need to solve uh, equations for distribution functions. The second technical detail is this scattering terms or high order correlation terms. In different uh, situations, we can approximate them by different uh, in different ways. So in general, these terms are given by a matrix with a complex valued elements. And this matrix couples equations for different wave vectors. The real part of this uh, matrix describes shifts of energy levels, and the uh, imaginary part describes broadening of energy states. The simplest approximation that we can make here is to use constant dephasing uh, factor, which assumes that those matrices are diagonal, and each element on the main diagonal has same value. And this is Lorentz, this will give Lorentzian shape of uh, optical response function. And yeah, so if you need to be more precise and more rigorous, you can uh, derive this matrices using high order uh, kinetic equations for uh, high order correlation function. So this constant means that we've truncated our hierarchy uh, problem at the level of Hartree-Fock, Hartree-Fock level. Now, I think it's pretty straightforward now. It's just ordinary differential equations. And this system of differential equations can be pretty large because we have one equation for one wave for each wave vector. And those equations are coupled. So depending on how we discretize brilliant zone, we can have hundreds of equations coupled together. And let's try to understand how to compute this sum. So this sum has been derived from uh, uh, Liouville equations, and it's pretty abstract. It's sum over quantum numbers. In case in semiconductors, this quantum number is wave vector. But we know that wave vector is not a discrete quantity. It's uh, continuous over a brilliant zone. So how, we would, how would we sum them up, wave vectors? So we can use the uh, born von Karman boundary conditions. This means that we can place a semiconductor in large box, make a big box of semiconductor material. And then we, in, if we have large box in real space, in uh, reciprocal space, we have discrete uh, wave vectors. And the space in between two points in the reciprocal space is defined how large this box is. So L is the uh, size of this box and D is dimensionality. So we, if we have three dimensional box, you can guess how, how large the spacing is. So larger sizes of box, uh, less distance between wave vectors you have in reciprocal space. And now if we just multiply and divide by same value delta K here, we can, and take limit, we can proceed to this integral. So for wave vectors, we have to integrate over brilliant brilliant zone. And this L, the size of the box, which is artificial uh, notion, this box doesn't really exist, is very annoying. And to get rid of this L, we can divide semiconductor block equations by characteristic sizes of this box. And it means that all quantities are going to be uh, given per unit volume, if it's three-dimensional case or unit of error, if it's two-dimensional case. Because we want to get rid of this L, which is unknown, we need to divide everything by L power D. 
Okay, and this integral is something reasonable. We can discretize it, and now we can compute this sum by discretizing this integral. A very similar expression can be obtained in polar coordinates. So this is Cartesian coordinates, and this is expression for polar coordinates. And in polar coordinates, we have now k has meaning of radius, and then we have angle, uh, solid angle, which we have to integrate uh, over. And k has different power depending on dimensionality of the system. In three dimensional system, it's k squared. In two dimensional system, is k uh, just k linear. And why we are interested in polar coordinates is because sometimes we can apply axial approximation. Uh, band structure, sometimes it depends uh, strongly on the wave vector magnitude, but it doesn't depend much on the angle. So you see here we have axial symmetry. So uh, band structure is same for different angles, and it depends only on the length of wave vector. If it's, if, it's the, if it is the case, we can integrate over solid angle immediately. And depending on dimensionality of the system, we have different coefficients because in three dimensional case, this integral gives four pi. In two dimensional case, this integral gives two pi. And then a system becomes effectively one dimensional because we can take any ray in reciprocal space and, and solve problem for this ray integrating over angles. And if we are dealing with scattering problems, we can average scattering over all angles. So even in three-dimensional case, we essentially solve one-dimensional problems in reciprocal space. And we don't need to sum over all three dimensions. We reduce system just to one dimension, no case which is very useful and this axial approximation used very often in semiconductor block equations but sometimes it doesn't work and then we need to sum over all wave vectors which makes uh, everything very uh, time consuming all right so now let's consider coulomb coupling in semiconductor block equations you always have coulomb coupling if you are dealing with charged particles and this Coulomb coupling is unknown for now, but we can derive it. So this is very well known uh, integral from quantum chemistry. This is general form of Coulomb coupling. Psi is a wave function, and in semiconductors, wave function can be represented as a block waves. And these block waves waves allows us to simplify Coulomb uh, coupling dramatically because uh, these plane waves, they make everything easy. And if we substitute this representation of wave function into this integral, we will end up with this uh, expression. And in long wavelengths, wavelengths limit, these uh, integrals are essentially delta functions. So these stories here is that a product of periodic boundary functions Oh, the product of periodic uh, function is also a periodic function, and we can do Fourier transform. So B is a Fourier transform of a product of periodic block functions, but uh, those functions are orthogonal, and we can use this orthogonality in order to derive the simplified expressions. So they are, these expressions for Coulomb coupling, they're going to be different depending on dimensionality of the system. This expression is for three-dimensional case. This expression is for two-dimensional case. And here we are using long wavelength limit. And this uh, derivation works for systems with periodic boundary conditions. But if we have a system with fi finite sizes, like for example, quantum well, uh, we call them quasi two dimensional structures because we have uh, material which is very, have large sizes in two dimension and it has quantum confinement in third dimension. And in this case, we can use envelope function approximation. So we replace one of the exponent here in the direction of quantum confinement by an envelope function. 
this envelope function has to be smooth on the scale of unit cell. If it, if it is the case, then we can end up with a uh, club compliment that looks like this. It's pretty similar to the two-dimensional case, except now we have additional integral over uh, envelope functions. Envelope function comes from the uh, quantum confinement effect, and we have additional index n here that describes some band index. So in bulk semiconductor, we have lambda and k, which is band index and wave vector. Due to quantum confinement, in quantum well, we have band index, subband index, and wave vector. So this shows th this Coulomb coupling couples different subbands. But it, this expression can be solved numerically, and we can get uh, into account contribution from finite size effect. Effectively, this integral works as a screening. So it produces additional dependence on wave vector in plane wave vector. And instead of li linear function here, we can have some power series. Now, when we know uh, globe coupling and we know how to evaluate this sum or integral, in principle, everything is known here. This is band structure normalized by exchange energy. This is distribution functions. So now we can solve this equation uh, relative to mi microscopic polarization. If we take a closer look on this expression, on this equation, it can remind us uh, an oscillator. So if we remember quantum mechanics, uh, classical mechanics, we can make classical mechanics analogy. We can take a Newton's equation and if we introduce new variable where complex variable where real part is a generalized coordinate and imaginary part is generalized momentum we can plug it into the newton's equation and at the end we will get a, a system of equations that looks very similar to this one and in these equations we see that this part is a, a frequency of oscillator and this part is external force that acts on the oscillator. And this short term is a dumping. So it's a classical oscillator with dumping. But since we have index K here, we have many oscillators. So these equations can be seen as an ensemble of classical oscillators. Each oscillate with different frequency because uh, energy of oscillations is dependent on wave vector. So for each point in brilliant zone, we have an oscillator that oscillates with its specific uh, frequency. And then external electromagnetic field drives this oscillator out of equilibrium, and it oscillates and dumps with certain dumping. And many body effects leads to coupling between oscillators. So you can imagine that there is additional spring that couples different points here. So it's pretty interesting object to study. So if you neglect coupling between oscillators, each of them oscillate with certain period of oscillations depending on band structure. And yeah, here you can see microscopic polarization. Uh, y axis is time, X axis is wave vector. And here are slices of this microscopic polarization for different wave vectors. Now, if we take into account a Coulomb coupling between electrons and holes, we see that oscillations uh, have been changed and they're trying to oscillate in phase because oscillators are coupled, they're trying to oscillate in phase. And now we see some collective modes are forming here. And these collective modes, essentially, they are excitons in time domain and wave vector domain. So these excitonic effects can be seen on this graph as uh, collective modes of oscillations. So all these quantities they are represented here, they are microscopic polarizations, PK. But it's not something that we can measure. And if you're interested in uh, measurable optical characteristic, we need to post-process this quant quantity. 
So the first step would be to compute macroscopic polarization. Macroscopic polarization is sum over all wave vectors multiplied by dipole moment per unit volume. And then when we know time dependent macroscopic polarization, we can Fourier transform it. And when we divide it by Fourier transform of uh, external electromagnetic field, we will get susceptibility, optical susceptibility. And imaginary part of optical susceptibility give us uh, absorption spectrum. So after this chain of post-processing computation, we can uh, compute optical absorption spectrum. And this is something that can be measured and we can compare our theory to experimental results. But um, optical absorption is not the only quantity we can uh, derive from semiconductor block equations. There are many others. We can derive also luminescence or pump probe uh, response. So this is just one example of what we can compute with semiconductor block equations. So now let's let me give you two examples how it works. So if we proceed through all this computation I've just described, we can compute absorption spectrum. And for example, here is gallium arsenide, three-dimensional bulk gallium arsenide. And I computed two spectral characteristics for different broadening. This is broadening one milli electron volt and 10 milli electron volt. Broadening is related to the phasing uh, time. And we see that uh, for broadening one electron, mill electron volt, we see excitonic peak. And for larger broadening, which can mean uh, higher temperatures, for example, or more scattering effects, excitonic peak disappears. The position exit of excitonic peak should be at one, which is the case. So it's normalized by experimentally uh, observed uh, exciton binding energy. So it should be one. If it's one, it means it corresponds to experimental data. And if we compare a dashed line with solid line, we see effect of many body interactions. So solid line corresponds to the case when we take into account Coulomb coupling between particles and dashed line on both pictures corresponds to the case when we consider free particle uh, limit where we neglect it. Coulomb interaction. What is interesting is that even in continuous spectrum, we see a significant effect of many body interactions. So many body interactions, they are responsible for formation of exciton peaks, but also they produce some correction to absorption for higher energies. So this difference is, is called Zomerfeld. I think it's called Zomerfeld enhancement factor. So difference between free particle and many particle absorption in plasma. This is plasma effect. In two dimensional case, due to larger uh, Coulomb coupling, uh, binding energy of exciton is larger and the exciton peak is more pronounced, more profound. And it can be observed even at a, a larger broadening. So it can survive even at uh, room temperature in two dimensional case. So, yeah. So this is actually a story of, of success. A semiconductor block equations has been proven to work well for uh, gallium arsenide and all other three, five semiconductors. What I want to, to show at the end is some uh, limitations of uh, semiconductor block equations. So recently we've tried to apply semiconductor block equation to this a chemical compound. And it's a very interesting thing because this uh, crystal can be seen as a bunch of atomic chains coupled together in two dimensions via Van der Waals forces. So in one dimensional, we have pretty dense crystalline structure. In two other dimensions, we have large spaces and they are coupled via Van der Waals forces. And as a consequence for this structure, we have very anisotropic band structure. We have almost flat bands in two dimensions and we have very large dispersion in third dimension. And for me, it's very challenging to apply semiconductor block equation for this structure. It's, it's out of zone of comfort, let's say, for semiconductor block equations. Uh, I'm interested in low temperature and stationary uh, case. 
So I don't really need to solve time dependent problem. I can uh, reduce this problem to a set of linear algebraic equation by taking Fourier transform. And I can derive something like a Green's function. And then at the end, I need to invert matrix to compute absorption spectrum. So in the stationary case for low temperature, you can solve a system of linear different linear algebraic equations instead of ordinary differential equations and you need just to invert matrix and when i do it i get this absorption spectrum so a dashed line again dashed line is a free particle limit and solid line is absorption spectrum with many body effects and gray line is what i want to reproduce this is uh, results from uh, bissell peter equation approach. And we see huge discrepancies. So uh, semiconductor block equation doesn't work well here. And we were trying to understand why we can't do these computations with semiconductor block equations. And we needed to revisit Coulomb coupling. So we use this form of Coulomb coupling with anisotropic uh, screening. And as you remember, I mentioned that uh, we are usually working in uh, long wavelength limit when we assume that this uh, uh, coefficients are orthogonal, but uh, it's not the case in this uh, particular uh, problem. So we need to take some non-zero elements B here. Uh, fortunately, there are not many of them. So most of them are very close to zero and only fifth, five of them are producing big contribution. So once we've done it, we will get much better agreement with uh, Bissell Salpeter results. So the why is that is because uh, semiconductor block equations, they work well for uh, one year mod excitons where exciton radius is much larger than unit cells. And in this case, Klopp coupling couples only wave vectors. But imagine that now we have uh, unit cells twice larger and exciton is confined within unit cell. In this case, we have more band coupling. So we need to uh, derive Coulomb coupling that couples on also bands, not only wave vectors. And this uh, B coefficient, they are responsible for a band mixing effect. And in this case, Semiconductor block equations, they do not work very well, and they become essentially a limit of Bissell-Salpeter equations. And this is where we have troubles applying them. So I think I have to finalize now. And if you want to read more about semiconductor block equations, you can uh, take a look on those two books. They are excellent for practical and for theoretical uh, approaches. And also we have published last paper about semiconductor block equations where you can find lots of useful information about its applications. So semiconductor block equations are very useful if you want to describe <coughs> uh, optical response of semiconductors and one year excitons. However, it's very challenging to apply them to the uh, Frankel excitons. It can be useful for charge transfer excitons where uh, exciton radius is slightly larger than unit cell. And also semiconductor block equations are very useful for time dependent problems such as uh, pump probe experiments, and they can be useful also to describe luminescence of semiconductors. Uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Uh, anyone got questions for Mike? <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, sorry, can I ask a quick question? Yes. Um, hi, yeah, I'm Mira. Um, yeah, I, so you mentioned these beta cell Peter equations briefly. Yes. What does that involve exactly? I mean, how are they different from this? Yeah. Yeah, business Peter equations is a way to take into account uh, electron hole coupling and compute excitonic, uh, compute exciton binding energy. The advantage of business Peter equation is that it's universal and it can be applied to DFT results on the top of DFT results. 
And uh, it's very time consuming because it sums over all wave to compute uh, exciton binding energy. We need to integrate over all wave vectors and sum over all bands, including many empty bands. And the convergence in terms of number of bands is very slow. Uh, also, business Alpeter equation works not very good when we are dealing with excitons with very large radius. On the other hand, semiconductor block equations, they are good for one year mode excitons with large radius, but they're not working well for Frankel excitons with small um, radius. Another advantage of semiconductor block comparing to business Salpeter equation is that it is time dependent formalism. So business Salpeter equation gives you eigenstates of excitons, but they don't show you time dependent uh, evolution of exciton. And for example, if you are interested in scattering effects, how exciton uh, interacts with the environment, business Salpeter equation cannot give you the answer. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. I see. I see. So it's a sort of more uh, sophisticated approach for calculating the binding energy, including trying to include all the. It's more uh, a Benicio inspired yeah. approach yeah. and less yeah. time dependent approach. Yeah. So, yeah. If you take a look on static limit of semiconductor block equation, they look like Bissess Alpeter equation. So, this term here, it's essentially Bissess Alpeter equation in a way. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, maybe I could just ask one more question and I'll let other people. Sure. Um, sure. You talked about linear uh, spectro uh, spectroscopy. What about nonlinear case? Oh, yeah. Uh, to take into account nonlinear effects in the framework of semiconductor block equation, it's very simple. You just need to add two more equations to solve. So if you solve the system of three equations, then we are dealing with nonlinear problem. Nonlinear means that we have such strong electromagnetic field that it's able to change uh, population of bands dramatically. And the source of nonlinearity is changes of population of bands. So we change distribution function. So if we solve all three equations all together, we are in nonlinear limit. If we say that, okay, maybe we have such a weak electromagnetic field that it's not able to change population of bands, then we just solve one equation for polarization. And here we are in linear limit. In linear limit, we assume that uh, population of bands is constant in time and is given by Fermi-Dirac distribution function. So this is linear limit. So yeah. Essentially, initially, semiconductor block equations have been developed for nonlinear optics, nonlinear physics. But as a limiting case, they cover also linear regime as well. Linear re regime is a good example for students to start uh, doing computations with semiconductor block equations because they simplify everything. And yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Anyone else has got a question? Just jump in. Yeah, maybe I had a question. So, if I understand correctly, you're including uh, energy two particle correlations in there, which allow so the Coulomb correlations, I guess I'm talking about in particular, so which gives you your excitons. So, then if you wanted to incorporate by excitons, do you then need to go to the next level of sort of expansion? Yes, relations? yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. So if you want to consider by excitons, we need to deal with high level correlation functions because we need to define what by exciton is. And for by excitons, density matrix, in this form doesn't provide enough information. So polarization is an, gives enough information to detect the uh, excitonic peak, but by excitonic energy can be obtained if we consider time dependent evolution of uh, correlation function that look like this. So we, by exciton is uh, two electrons and two holes. So we need to define 
we need to derive time evolution of expectation value for this correlation. Not, not particularly this correlation function, but something like that. So microscopic polarization doesn't have information about by excitons. It has information only about excitonic peak. So yeah, and then we plug this in, this correlation function into Liouville equation, and we will derive something that looks like this, but for another correlation function. So yeah, at the end, semiconductor block equations for by exciton will be similar to semiconductor block equations for density matrix elements, but with some additional terms that describes correlation between by exitons. So in the, yeah, thanks for that. Um, I guess going back to the case of excitons, how different solutions do you get if you look at, you know, just the, the two body, you know, the Coulomb attraction of your electron and hole, as opposed to sort of the full calculation with the K dependence? Because I guess that's the difference between a, a many body solution as opposed to a, a two body. I mean, I mean, it's same. Two body interaction in real space, if you do Fourier transform of everything, you will get something like interaction of many plane waves. So if you have some localized particles in space with local with the Coulomb interaction and you do Fourier transform, you will get many coupled plane waves. So you can transform if you transform semiconductor block equation into real space, you will get something like one year equation for exciton. But why it's useful? Why it's useful to solve this equation in the uh, wave vectors in the uh, reciprocal space is because there are many other scattering effects, uh, scattering events that can be expressed in terms of wave vectors, and you can add them on the top of that. And now instead of just two body, you have many real many body problem when you have exciton inside electron hole plasma, and this excitons collide with other electrons and holes and it's uniform approach. So when you just consider two body problem, maybe it's even better to solve this problem in real space as two body, two localized particles. But we have to take into account that your exciton dive, dives, floats inside a sea with many particles. So, yeah. Yep, thank you. Actually, maybe just one more on, on that point. So in your, uh, example for gallium arsenide. Am I right in saying you just included essentially a phenomenological decay there? So for all those scatter terms. Yes. Phenomenological. Yeah. So how how complicated is it to add you know, specific, I guess, decay channels or scattering channels in there? How much does that complicate the solving of those equations? The I mean, to answer your question, we need to consider two aspects. One aspect is numerical. Numerical is not that much uh, complicated. So if you want to add real Coulomb coupling instead of defacing time, which, so this real coupling is represented by a matrix sigma and lambda that couples equations for different wave vectors. And sigma is the real part and the lambda is the imaginary part. So theoretically, it's pretty hard to derive these matrices. But once we know these matrices, we just plug them in into numerical routine and we compute everything. There are many papers about how this many body uh, couplings can be derived. And there are different approaches using second born approximation, Boltzmann uh, kinetic equations. If we look at them at very high level, they essentially comes from the high order uh, equations in hierarchy problem. So if we keep deriving equations and if we solve equations for uh, second order correlation function, then we put it back into this equation, we will get these matrices. So, yeah. I mean, the form of this matrix is known. You can take it from, books or papers, but it's still ongoing work because you always have to deal with some level of approximation and it's very hard to understand sometimes what is the, uh, how we should approximate them at which level. 
Sorry, maybe I can ask a question on this point here, because I thought somehow you should be able to, in principle, describe things like coupling to a bi-exiton by these terms sigma and lambda. Mm -hmm. Of course, you will not get this by the Born approximation, which cannot describe uh, bound states. Mm -hmm. Likely you won't, and likewise, you won't get it for a Boltzmann approach, which also cannot describe bound states. But I think in principle, if you could compute these terms exactly, Mm -hmm. then you would see that the bi exitons should show up in these kind of terms. Yeah, it's a good point, yeah. I, I agree with it. I actually, I had another question about the gallium arsenide results and it's really yes. what, what Jeff was saying as well. So I was just wondering what kind of many body effects have you taken into account here? Is this re really just considering essentially like a two body problem? Yes, yes. For this tutorial, my goal was to show two aspects of semiconductor block equations, how to derive them from abstract uh, Hamiltonian, from any Hamiltonian you have, and how to do numerical computation. That's why I've taken the simplest possible case, linear optical response, and uh, I approximated all many body effects just by some dephasing factor, mm -hmm. uh, which corresponds to some scatterings. And, uh, for real, I've just taken into account two body interaction. So yeah, and this is what I wanted to show you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so it's just illustrative examples to guide you through all the numerical procedures, which has to be done to get first absorption spectrum. And also I elaborated a little bit on more advanced example when I've tried to use semiconductor block equation to reproduce results that has been obtained by business of Peter equation. Yeah. Okay. Normally, if we have one der Waals structures, we are trying to use semiconductor block equations for one dimension, and then we use the real space representation for those two dimensions. But I, I try to solve this uh, problem using uh, semiconductor block equations in uniform way with in recipro reciprocal space for in all directions. It's, so the point was to illustrate that it's very hard to apply semiconductor block equations for Van der Waals structures with large unit cells where exciton is bounded within one unit cell. So it's essentially Frankel exciton. Any other questions? Hi, yeah, maybe I have a, a small question. First, uh, thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, yeah, I'm wondering, uh, so in reciprocal space, uh, in, in real uh, computation, do you need to uh, consider the wall Brewen zone? What, what was that? What do I need to consider? Uh, uh, do you need to consider the wall Brewen zone? Or uh, to calculate uh, uh, yeah. absorption? Or can you truncate somewhere? Yeah, this is another topic which is very important and I didn't cover it. Yeah, in different cases it's different because it depends how large your exciton is. If it's very large in real space, it's supposed to be very localized in reciprocal space. And then you just need to take very small area of brilliant zone around gamma point, let's say. But it's not the case in many of materials. For example, this particular materials here, exciton is very localized, especially in two dimensions here. It means that it's very delocalized in reciprocal space. And here I needed to integrate over whole brilliant zone. And even that it wasn't enough, I needed to go beyond them and integrate also over bands. So I need to sum up contribution from different bands. So this is illustrative examples. In some cases where your exciton is large compared to unit cell, you just uh, consider a small region around the gamma point. But in case when your exciton is localized within unit cells, you need to go through whole brilliant zone and then even beyond you go to some over uh, 
energy bands. So it depends on particular system and particular configuration of excitonic states. I see. And so. yeah, and also it's it's tricky to define boundaries. So it's uh, it's like a try, you you need to try, and then you need to change borders. So you need to truncate wave vectors at some point, and you try it, and you see how your results converge. So when you change uh, limits, borders of your uh, reciprocal space domain, and it doesn't affect your results, you say that, okay, I've converged. But if you see that your results are sensitive to choice of your boundaries in a brilliant zone, then you need to in, uh, use larger domains. Another point is how to choose the born von Karman boundary conditions, how large box in real space we have to take meaning how small distance between wave vectors we should take, how should we discretize a brilliant zone. It's another issue and it's, yeah, it, it will require some time to elaborate on that. Okay, okay, I see, thank you. At least it's, it's not so easy, uh, yeah, I, I can imagine. I mean, as usual in ab initio computation, you deal with lots of grids and meshes in real space, in time domain, in wave vector domain. And if you want to prove that your results are really ab initio, you need to prove convergence of your results. To prove convergence, you need to play with your grids and boundaries of your domains. Uh, you can't get results with one shot computation. So if you just do one computation and you get results, you can't prove that you've got something valuable unless you prove that you have converged results. So it's same for DFT and for any other method. Okay, I see. Thank you. You're welcome. Last minute questions, guys, before we let Mike run off and do his work. No. Mike, um, we might call it quits there, but thank you very much for that talk. Thank you, too. Um, uh, I will send you the link to the recording. Yep. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Bye.